So all you little ones, go ahead. The rest of you, open up your Bible to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. It's, a, oh, it's a, just a guitar pick. I'll, I'll get it. I don't think it's a big... I thought it was... Ugh. If anybody lost a guitar pick, here it is up front. I don't know who would possibly lose this up in the very front where a guitar is played. But if you've lost a guitar pick, I'm putting it right there. We need to see some form of identification when you redeem it, please. Uh, we're in Romans 7. Give me verses 1 through 6 this morning. Um, you know, I, I, I think I've said this before. Um, you know, Paul tells us in, in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is, is inspired by God. It's breathed out by God, and it's profitable for reproof and rebuke and for instruction and for training in righteousness uh, so that the man of God may be well equipped, right? And that, that means a lot of things as we consider the Word, right? It means it's, it's authoritative in our life. It means that it's, um, it's instructive in our life. It means a lot of things, right, as we consider the Bible. Um, it also means that the Bible has this unique ability to speak into our existence in the way no other book can right? It's able, as the writer of Hebrews says, to, to pierce even the division of soul and spirit, right? And, and to expose us and, and to, to give us a, a, a vision into our own hearts oftentimes. And, and no other book can do that because no other book is inspired by God. No other book is alive, breathing, and living, right? Which is why oftentimes we can come to the Bible and we can read a section of the Bible and we can just be completely undone by it, right? Um, maybe some of you are like that. You have a passage in the Bible, one that just like Lord is used in a, in, a, in a really powerful way in your own walk with Christ and your own existence. Well, for me, that's Romans chapter 7. Like, I'm really excited to go through Romans 7 with you because Romans 7 is, is the passage in the scriptures that the Lord used in my life to awaken me to my sinfulness and my death and my depravity and to begin to lead me out of death and into life through His Son, Jesus Christ. I can remember where I was and I can remember what it was like when we opened this Bible and I read Romans 7 for the first time. And so uh, I am excited to head into this chapter with you as I've been excited throughout the whole book of Romans. Uh, and I hope it's been fruitful for you as well as we've walked through this study together and we'll continue to for a, a while to come. But let's look at the first six verses of Romans 7 this morning. Let's read together. Paul writes, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, but... If her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. This is the word of the Lord. May he be glorified at the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and we just thank you for the opportunity now to head into your word, to just dig deeply in, in, into the into the truth of your word, Father God. And we come this morning confessing, Lord, the inspiration of your word. We come this morning confessing, as Paul tells young Timothy, that your word is breathed out. This, this Bible is inspired by you. You're working through the writers and the authors so that the words that they put on the paper are the very words you would have spoken to us, Lord. And they come, Father, with your authority. And so, Lord, we come confessing the authority of your word this morning. We come confessing, Father God, our need to hear from you. Moses says these are not idle words, but they are life. And so, Father, we come to feast off of your truth this morning. Nourish us this morning. Nourish our souls from your truth, Father God, that we might glorify and honor you as we walk in obedience to your word, as we walk in newness of life as Paul has called us to, and so bring glory and honor and praise to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You know, there's a saying in English uh, that a deal can be too good to be true. Um, for the last 20 years or so, actually, he's, he's now retired, but for the previous 20 years or so, my dad sold cars in the U.S. And so I never bought a car from anybody but my father since I've been driving. And, and I've had a lot, a lot of cars. 
Now, in fact, when I came to Korea, that was the first time I had a car that came from anybody other than my dad. Now, there were times that I was tempted to buy a car from somebody other than my dad. Um, because, you know, if you're from the U.S. or if you've seen any car commercials, really, you sit down and they start to give you this, this kind of idea, right, that, that they have the most amazing sale for you, right? And they start to tell you that the deal, the amount of money you're going to save is more than you could possibly dream of. And the price that you're actually going to pay for the cars is lower than you could ever think. And, and you might not have ever thought you could own a brand new car, but you can own a brand new car. And there would be times that I'd be watching these ads on television. I think, man, I want a new car. A new car would be awesome. Look at that. I would look great in that car. At the time, I was driving a, a Ford Focus hatchback, which um, if you can imagine, it's about the size of a matchbox car. And, and so me in a matchbox car, I was kind of like, that'd be a good idea to get in a bigger car. In fact, Annie, I think she first met me when I had the matchbox car, and she, she, didn't, she, was like, she almost didn't date me because of my car. She's like, I don't know if I want to date a dude that rides around in a little matchbox car. So I would think, man, this is awesome. I want to, I want to get a new car. So I'd call my dad and be like, Dad. Listen, I love you, and I want to help you out. I want you to get a commission and all, but you won't believe what this dealership is promising me. And then that's when my dad, who was kind of on the inside, he would begin to tell me about the, the reality of that deal, right? He, he, he began to tell you about what, what they're promising and what they're really going to give you, right? And, and he would tell me about the, the print, the small print, right? You know, everything has small print, right? There's that tiny print that, that's, that's only written in, in like a size that an ant with a, a magnifying glass could read, right? Where, where it just, it outlines all the ways in which they're just tricking you with the big print, right? And so my dad would tell me, look, son, it's not a good deal. It sounds good, but it's, it's too good to be true, right? The thing is that I, th I think that we often, we often think grace is a deal that's too good to be true, Right? We look at grace and we like the idea of grace and we're, we're kind of cool with grace. But, but the, tr the reality is I, I, I think we oftentimes struggle, we struggle with grace. Particularly, we struggle with the freedom of grace. Grace, as the Bible presents it, is God's undeserved, unmerited favor that is freely given at his divine and sovereign discretion to those who are still in their trespasses and sins. I'm going to say that again. Maybe you're writing this down. But God's grace, or, or grace as we understand it from the scriptures, is God's undeserved and unmerited favor that is freely given at his divine discretion and sovereignty to those who are still in their trespasses and sins. And the reality is we've seen this already in Romans as we've gone through Romans. If we go back to Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 25, we, we read this. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So grace, grace is a, it's a gift. Right? It's given by God. It's a freely given gift by God. In Romans 5, 6 through 8, we, we read this. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, or still sinners, Christ died for us. And so grace is this free gift of God, freely given gift of God that's not given in response to our obedience, that's not given in response to goodness that's inside of us, but that's freely given at God's divine and sovereign discretion to those who are still in their sin and in their trespasses. Grace does not come in response to our goodness, but rather it comes at the discretion of God. Maybe better yet, grace does not come in response to our obedience to the law, but rather in response to our brokenness and sinfulness. And the truth is, I think that we struggle with this. And we struggle with this concept of God's freely given grace. I mean, we like the idea of it, but often we live as though we're going to stumble upon some small print 
that we forgot to look over and we forgot to read that's going to say, oh yeah, you can have grace, but you've got to do this, 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 and this. Or if you don't do this, this, and this, the grace will be removed from you and you will no longer have it. But as Paul says in other places, if that's what we think of grace, then, then that's not grace at all. You see, for the, over the past chapter and a half, Paul has been dealing with people who have a hard time understanding grace. He has been addressing for over a chapter now those who have a confusion or a misunderstanding or a hard time grasping the greatness and the freeness of God's grace. Now, primarily, this objection, I think, that Paul's been dealing with comes from people who have a Jewish background. But the, but the truth is that we all tend to struggle with grace. These objections that Paul anticipates and that he has no doubt encountered as he has preached the gospel around the world center on the contrast between law and grace. And in particular, how it is that the gospel of grace does not end in licentiousness. Now, if you don't know what that word means, look it up. Every once in a while, I've decided now with my sermons to start throwing out like $10 words. They're just like they're for your benefit, for your growth and your development. So licentiousness, that's a word that you can, you have a phone, just Google it right now, right? Google, what does licentious mean? And he, she will tell you, right? But that's the problem there, is that, is that there are people who hear Paul proclaim a gospel of grace, a gospel of freedom, a gospel that, that frees you from the law, and they can't wrap their minds around how that doesn't end in a free license to live sinfully. And so the, the question, the question we want to answer this morning, and the question I hope we answer by the end of this sermon, is if through grace we are free from the law, how is it that the gospel of grace does not end in a free license for sinful living? That's what has occupied Paul over the last chapter and a half, and that is what he addresses again here in chapter 7, is if through grace we are free from the law, how is it that the gospel of grace does not end in a free license for sinful living? And so our hope this morning is to answer that question to make sure that we all have a good grasp and understanding of the great grace of Jesus Christ. So for over a chapter now, Paul has been dealing with this contrast of law and grace. The contrast really began for us back in chapter 5, verse 20. If we look back at chapter 5, verse 20, Paul writes, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And then chapter 6 was spent dealing with supposed objections to Paul's teaching that grace out abounds sin, which is increased by the law. Interestingly enough, as we look at chapter 6, the two questions that are posed to Paul, or the two questions that he really deals with in a diatribe kind of way, focus on sinning in light of this great grace. I think this gives us a good insight into what is going on here. In chapter 5, verse 20, where Paul says that the law came to increase the trespass, law, or Paul ascribes to the law a function that was contrary to what was the accepted idea or understanding of the law. The common Jewish understanding of the law, as we saw a couple weeks ago, was that the law was put in place as a check against sinful behavior. Right? The common understanding of the law was that the law was there to govern the sinfulness of mankind. And in reality, that's how we understand law, right? I mean, that, that, that's our understanding of law. There's speed limit signs, and there's traffic signs, and there's all other kinds of laws that we understand are meant to govern our actions in order to promote um, unity and harmony and cohesiveness and the ability to live together, right? Now, the truth is, is that the law, God's law, does function in that way, right? The law is multifunctional. In fact, in Matthew chapter 19, uh, where Jesus is talking about divorce, he says that Moses gave commands concerning divorce because of the hardness of heart of the people. And so in one way, the law does function to govern our sinfulness. But Paul in 520 goes beyond that to the deeper purpose and the, more, and the fuller purpose of the law, showing that it actually came to increase the trespass. 
as we saw a few weeks ago, alongside that increase is the superabundant increase of God's grace. And so, seizing on this misunderstanding or apparent misunderstanding and misuse of the law, these assumed and possibly quite real opponents of the Apostle Paul accuse him of preaching a lawless gospel that encourages sinful behavior. And this explains these questions that he encounters in chapter 6. He's being accused by people of preaching a lawless gospel that actually encourages sinful behavior. So the first question comes in chapter 6, verse 1, where they say, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Right? Paul proclaims that the law increases sin, but grace out abounds the law. And so these people who can't wrap their mind around grace say, well, then probably, Paul, you're telling us that we should sin to increase grace. Right? And what does Paul say? May it never be. Right? In 6, 1 through 14, he denies this or rejects this idea by saying that we are now dead to sin. We're dead to sin and we're alive to God, so how can those who are dead to sin continue to live in sin? It doesn't work that way, right? And all of this reaches its conclusion in chapter 6, verse 14, where Paul says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. And then this leads, obviously, to the second question, which Justin took care of last week as he preached from Romans 6, or 15 through 23, where the people say, okay, all right, we're dead to sin and life, but now you're saying, Paul, we're not under the law anymore. So since we're not under the law, the law which governs our sinful behavior, the law which tells us what we can and can't do and how far we can go and how far we are allowed to pursue, like since we're not under that anymore, then, then we should sin now because we're not under the law, but we're now under grace. And what does Paul say again? May it never be. And his point in Romans chapter 6, 15 through 23 is that having died to sin and being alive to God, you are now no longer enslaved to sin, but rather now you can be enslaved to God. You can offer your members to the Lord for righteousness and no longer have to offer your members to sinfulness for unrighteousness, which leads to death. And so Paul's answer to both of these questions is that grace, grace does not end in sin, but rather grace ends in freedom from sin. And so now this brings us to chapter 7. Now Paul is done answering these supposed questions, and he begins to ask some questions of his own as he seeks to explain his point. Paul's concern here in chapter 7, his main concern is, is twofold, really. Firstly, Paul wants to continue to show that the gospel he proclaims is the true and only gospel of God, despite what some critics are saying about him. We need to remember that as Paul is writing this letter to the churches at Rome, he really is introducing himself, right? He hasn't had any personal experience with the believers at Rome, and so he's introducing himself, and he's introducing the gospel he proclaims. And so Paul is in chapter 7, and really in the whole entire book, he is he is defending and asserting the validity and veracity of the gospel that he proclaims, showing that it is the one and only one gospel of God. Secondly, his aim here is in looking back at chapter 6, verse 14, he wants to show how it is that believers are free from the law and the end to which that brings them. And that's what we want to focus on this morning as we look at these six verses, as Paul explains to us how believers are free from the law and the end to which that brings us. As we look at these verses, there's no doubt that they are connected to chapter 6, verse 15 through 23, but really they go beyond that. As we look at chapter 7, Paul is really bringing all the themes that he talked about in chapter 6, and he's kind of allowing them to kind of bloom and blossom to fullness and really expressing and uh, explaining the deep reality below them. As we look at verse 1 in chapter 7, Paul begins by stating a truth that all who know the law would agree to. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Paul says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. As we look at chapter 7, verse 1, I don't think it's necessary for us to think that Paul is limiting his audience to those who are of a Jewish background, right? Paul says, listen, my brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. And, and we would naturally maybe think that, well, he's just talking to the Jews now. But, but the reality is that there's probably many in the church at Rome who, who know the law. 
right? In the early church, many of the people who are coming to Christ oftentimes are proselytes, right? They're coming out of a, a, a conversion to Judaism into Christianity, right? And so there's many in the church who probably have a functioning knowledge of the Old Testament. And even if they don't have a functioning knowledge of Old Testament law, like the obvious nature of this statement is so plain that universal agreement is expected, right? Paul says, we know that the law is binding on people so long as they're alive. Well, that makes perfect sense, right? You, you don't give dead people speeding tickets. That, does, that doesn't happen, right? You, you don't accuse a dead person of breaking into your home and, and robbing from you. Like dead people don't break the law and the law doesn't apply to dead people because they're dead, right? So it's a universally accepted idea. It's a universally accepted agreement that law is binding on people so long as they are alive. And so what Paul does in, chat, in verses 2 and 3 is he gives a clear illustration of this principle. And so he, he dips back into the Old Testament law and he pulls out a clear illustration to make his point. And so he uses the illustration of marriage. Look at verses 2 and 3. Paul says, For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives... But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. And so Paul looks at the law of marriage. And he says, we understand this concept and we see it clearly in the law of marriage. So if you have a woman and she's married... If she leaves her husband and she goes and marries another man or lives with another man, she is going to be called an adulteress. If her husband is still alive, she's going to be called an adulteress. She's going to be accused of breaking the law and she's going to be treated as one who is a lawbreaker and deserves just punishment. And everybody would nod their head and go, yeah, that's what the law says. That makes perfect sense, Paul. Paul would say, conversely, however, if her husband dies... If her husband dies and she, she goes and lives with another man or marries another man, we should say marries another man, not lives with another man. We're not, we're not encouraging cohabitating here. She marries another man. Right? Paul says she's not going to be called an adulteress because she'll be free from the law. And you would be wrong to accuse her of adultery because her husband has died and she's married to another man and she's been freed by the death of her husband. And everybody would say, yeah, Paul, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. That's how the law functions. That's how the law works. When you die, you're free from the law. When the man dies, she's free from the law of her husband. It's very interesting how the word marriage works out in this text. If you look at it in the Greek, the word marriage is, is a word for being under a man, hupandras. And so marriage is to be under the law of a man. And then literally Paul says when she's free from the law of marriage, he says she's free from the law of the man, Right? And we would say, yeah, that makes perfect sense. The guy's dead. She's free from that law. She can do what she wants to do within reason, we hope, right? So what Paul does at this point now is he brings this truth to bear on those who are listening to him. So in verse 4, he, he brings application. He says, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. And so he looks at me and says, look, just like this woman whose husband has died and is now freed from the law. So you too have died to the law through the body of Jesus Christ. Right now, this picks up on the theme that Paul was going over in 6, 1 through 14, right? Where Paul says, he says that we're united with Christ in a death like his so that we might be united with him in a resurrection like his and having died with him and being raised with him, we have now died to sin. We have now died to death so that these things no longer have dominion over us. And now in Romans 7 verse 4, Paul says that this death that we died with Christ and this new life that we have with Christ is not only a death to sin and it's not only a death to death, but Paul says it's also a death to to the law, so that being raised with Jesus Christ, you are now free from sin, death, and the law. Now, this is a point that's going to get unpacked as we move into the second half of chapter 7, but, but, but what Paul makes clear here is that there are three powers that are reigning over sinful humanity. That's sin, death, and the law. And Paul's going to explain how the law functions in there. The law is not bad. The law is holy and righteous and good, he says. But the law is a power that sin takes advantage of to keep people in subjection to sin and death. And Paul says, when you are united with Christ in death and raised in resurrection like his, you're free. You're free from the law. 
You're free from sin and you're free from death. So going back to chapter 6, verse 14, you are no longer under the law. How are we not under the law anymore, Paul? You're not under the law anymore because you've died with Christ. You've been united with him in his death and now you've been raised up in a newness of life and this new life is a free life. It's free. It's free from sin. It's free from death and it is free from the law. Have you ever seen those movies where people fake their own death? There's a, there's a new movie coming out that's... Um, that uh, I can't remember the title of it. I, sometimes I watch trailers, and, I, and I've been trying not to recently. But the whole premise of the movie is like this, this person is died, right? And like so all records of them have been expunged, and so they have this new free life, right? Now, I, I would like to do this with my, my student loans. That would be my goal, right? It's like somehow convince the federal government that I've died. And so they'll be like, ah, oh, we'll forget his loans, right? And then, and then like, woohoo, I'm alive, right? And I'd be free, right? I would be free from my loans. And that's, that's kind of the premise behind that whole thought. It's like, well, if I fake my death, then I'm, I'm free from whatever requirements or whatever burdens I was carrying, and now they're gone because everybody thinks I'm dead. And, and that's kind of the concept, only in a much more real and fantastic way. Paul says, you died with Jesus, and you were raised in newness of life with him, and you are free. The burden of sin that you were carrying, gone. We're going to sing about it in just a few minutes after the sermon. We're going to sing about how we're free from sin. And Paul says, the burden of death that you were carrying, gone. And the burden of the law that was oppressive over you and condemnation and in power through sin, gone. So you're free from the law. The question then becomes, what what is the end of this freedom? So, So we're free from the law through the death of Jesus Christ, but what is the end of this freedom. Well, that, that really depends on how you understand the law, right? I mean, how you understand and how you view the function of the law really works to determine what the end of that freedom is. So let's assume that, that your understood function of the law, how you understand the law, is that the law is in place to govern sinful behavior. That the law is in place to put a check and a hedge around you, telling you how far you can go and that you should go no farther. Well, if that's how you view the law, if you think of the law in that terms, then freedom from the law is not a very good thing, right? It's not a really good thing because then you're just kind of like a free radical going, well, I don't know what to do anymore. I don't know how to live anymore. I don't know where I can go and what I can't do anymore. There's no law telling me what I should and should not do. There's no law setting fences for me. There's no law governing my sinful behavior. And so now, apart from this law that governs my sinful behavior, I'm just going to sin like mad. I'm just going to sin like crazy. And see, that's how the mind is working of those who are opposing Paul. That's how the mindset is of those who don't understand grace and accuse Paul of preaching a lawless gospel. They're thinking, Paul, if you take that hedge away, if you take that fence away, we're just going to run rampant. You're just giving people free license to go sin wherever they want to and do whatever they want to do. And so if you think that way, freedom from the law is not a good thing. And it doesn't end in something beneficial. But if, If you see and understand the law the way that Paul has presented the law, if you understand that the law functions the way that Paul tells us the law functions, which is to increase trespass. And then we talked about that two weeks ago. We said the law increases our understanding of trespasses. It deepens our our understanding of our own sinfulness. Paul also says in the next verses of chapter 7 that sin seizes opportunity through the law to actually make us sin more. That's not a hard concept, is it? I mean, like, honestly, like, what if I put a whole bunch of chocolate chip cookies in front of you and I said, don't eat the cookies? What's going to happen? You're going to be tempted in every way possible to eat the cookies. It's human nature. It's who we are. And so if you understand the law the the way that Paul has presented the law, then freedom from the law becomes, becomes something fantastic. Freedom from the law becomes something, something otherworldly. I'm, I, I'm no longer under the, the oppression of this law. The, the, this thing that is, is working, or this thing that sin is taking advantage of to increase trespasses in me, this, this, this is no longer over me. And now freedom from the law becomes, becomes something wonderfully, wonderfully freeing. And that's what Paul is making clear in the rest of chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, is that Freedom from the law is a freeing thing. It's a good thing. And it doesn't end where we might naturally think it ends. Look at verse 4 again. Paul says, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. Listen, so that you may belong to another. 
to him who was raised from the dead in order that you may bear or that we may bear fruit for God. Listen to what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying, listen, brothers, you've died to the law, so go do whatever you want, man. Seriously, go do whatever you want. I know you've been holding on that secret sin. You've been wanting to do it, buddy. You've been wanting to exercise it. Well, there's no law anymore. Not telling you right or wrong. Just go do it. That's not what Paul says. Paul says you've been freed from the law, and there's a twofold purpose to your freedom. There's a twofold purpose to the freedom we have in law. First, it's so that we may belong to another. Look what Paul says. You've been freed from the law so that you may belong to another. Or a more appropriate translation would be so that you may marry another. Here Paul is going back to that illustration he gave us of the woman, and he's saying, listen, guys, here's what's happened. Here's what's happened. You have died with Jesus Christ, and you have been raised to walk in newness of life, and the result of this is that now you, in this freedom you have, you are married to Christ Jesus. You belong to him now. Before, Paul says in this, in this illustration of the woman, the woman's under the man. She belongs to the man. She's under the law of the man. But when the man dies, she's free to marry another man. What Paul's saying is you are under the law. You're under the, the condemnation of the law. You're under the working of the law, sin working through the law to make you even more sinful and increase your death and your condemnation. But now through Christ, you've been freed from that. And now you may belong or be married to Jesus Christ. Now listen to this, please. Listen. Paul doesn't say you're free to be married to another code or another ethical system or another law-based system. That's not what Paul says. Paul doesn't say you're free from the law just to grab onto another law. He doesn't say you're free from the law just to grab onto another list of demands and commands upon you. He says, no, you're free from the law to be bound intimately and deeply to the person Jesus Christ, the all-satisfying Savior the Lord of heaven and earth, through our death to the law, we are married, free to be married to Christ Jesus. Not bound to some other ethical code or some other system, but bound to Jesus. Not, I don't have, not many of you are married in here. There's quite a few of us that are married in here. But I'd venture to say that if I asked you what was the most, one of the most exciting, not the most, maybe one of the most exciting days of your life, it was my most exciting day, I don't want to speak for you guys, might be the day that you got married. Right? I remember what that was like. I, 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 I don't get nervous over a lot of things. Right? I get nervous before I preach, and my nervousness comes out in weird ways. I giggle a lot, and I freak out. I'm kind of a weird dude. Right? But otherwise, I don't really get nervous. But I was so unbelievably nervous before I got married. And it's like, why am I nervous? It's like, am, I, am I afraid like she's going to flip the script on me and just be like, nah, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I got gotcha. you, right? And she takes the dress off and just heads home. Well, wow, that would be awful. I'm glad you didn't do that. Thank you. But I was so unbelievably nervous, man. I was just, I was pacing back and forth. I was sweating bullets. Like I was, it's December, it was December 18th and I was just like, I was sweating in the mountains of North Carolina. And then I'm standing up in front of the church, me and, and, and my groomsmen, and uh, you, know, you see the door open. And our, our church we got married in was super tiny. I mean, literally, I'm standing here, and the door is probably where our door is, like really small. But it opened up, and I remember the first time I saw my wife in her dress coming down the aisle to become my wife. And I was just overcome in that moment. I was just overcome by the reality of the situation. I was overcome by her beauty. I thought, that's, that's my wife. Right, right. I'm, I'm marrying this, this person. This person is going to come into my life and we're going to be one person and we're going we're to share experiences and we're going to share life together and we're committed to one another so that, so that even in the hard times, she's not going to abandon me and I'm not going to abandon her. We're together in this thing called life now. And I remember looking at her and it's just, it, it's a new chapter. It's a new beginning in my existence. I, after we say I do, I am not the same man I was before we said I do. I'm a different man now. I'm bound to her by covenantal promises, and she's bound to me so that no longer does Dan exist as an individual and Annie exists as an individual, but now we exist as one person. And here Paul says that through freedom from the law, Christ has united himself to you, and you have united yourself to Jesus Christ so that you are not the same person you were before you were married to Christ. You are now different and you're united with Jesus in marriage. This is for all of us who have repented of our sins and come to Christ through faith. We're free from the law so that we may belong to Jesus Christ. So we may be married 
to Him, in union, in relationship with Him. In your life groups this week, you're going to hopefully discuss the differences between Christianity and other world religions. And I believe it boils down to this that through Christianity, we're not given another code of ethics to hold on to. We're not given another written law to walk and step with. We are given Jesus Christ in relationship, in marriage, and we are bound to him. And so Paul says the, the, first, the first result of this freedom from the law is you are now joined to Jesus Christ. The second purpose of this freedom from the law and one that overflows directly from belonging to Jesus is found in the, the, the end of verse 4 where Paul says, so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Now listen to that. Paul says you're freed from the law to belong to Jesus in order that, purpose statement, in order that we may bear fruit for God. The end of the law is not reckless, sinful behavior, but rather it is bearing fruit for God. This is the opposite of what everybody thought. This is the complete opposite of what everybody thought. Their concept, their idea of bearing fruit for God is walking in obedience to a written code, a written ethic, a written law, and that's how we bear fruit for God. We, we obey what we're told to obey, and if we obey what we're told to obey, that's pleasing to God, that's fruit for God, that's righteousness, and God's happy with that. But what Paul is saying, what Paul is saying is that bearing fruit for God is not done through lawful obedience, but rather bearing fruit for God is done through union with Jesus Christ. So much so that apart from union with Jesus Christ, one cannot bear fruit for God. Now this is a truth that, not comes only, that comes not only from the pen of Paul, but from the very mouth of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 15, beginning in verse 5, 4, actually in verse 4, Jesus says this, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. What? For apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Paul's not making up some new hip doctrine here. Paul is just regurgitating the truth of Jesus Christ that bearing fruit for God does not come through lawful obedience to some code, some rule, some law, but it comes through union with Jesus Christ. Being un unified with Him in a death like His, to be unified with Him in a resurrection like His, to be unified with Him in a marriage relationship, this intimate relationship with Christ results in bearing fruit for God. Far from leading to rampant sinfulness, freedom from the law leads to union with Christ, which leads to fruit for God. And what Paul does in verses 5 through 6 is he supports this thesis. Contrary to the law producing righteous fruit, as many would think, the law arouses our sinful passions, Paul says. Look at verse 5. Begins with the word for, right? Beginning with the word for means that Paul is grounding or explaining his previous statement. So you bear fruit for God through union with Christ. Why? Because while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work on our members to bear fruit for death. Now let's think for a moment. We do know that at least in part, Paul is speaking to the Jewish community, right? And how long did they have the law? How long? A thousand years or more? How did that work out for them? Not really good, did it? It ended in something we call captivity to some people called Babylon, right? And the, and the Jerusalem being destroyed, being raised to the ground. And what Paul is saying is like, look at your own history. Look at our history. What did the law do in our lives? Did it lead us to righteous fruit? No, our sinful passions were aroused by the law so that we increased in sinfulness, which led to our captivity. So you think that the law, obeying the law, brings righteous fruit, but it doesn't. It's incapable of bringing righteous fruit, not because of weakness in the law, but because of weakness in you. Weakness in us. 
Our sin seizes opportunity through the law to lead us into more sinfulness. So Paul says, you want to bear fruit, it's not going to happen through obedience to the law. So law is just going to lead to a sinful passions being aroused. And where does that end? We bear fruit for death. Not fruit for God, but fruit for death. But look at verse 6. But now, but now we are released from the law. We're released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Here's what I think Paul is saying there. I think this is what Paul is saying. I think that Paul is contrasting here the old covenant and the new covenant. And I think that Paul is saying exactly what the Old Old Testament promised about the new covenant, that the new covenant is an an internal covenant. It's an internal reality. It's not an external code to which we look at and hope it brings internal change, but rather through Christ Jesus, it's an internal change that flows out of us. And so now through union with Christ, we are filled with the promised Holy Spirit and the promised Holy Spirit does exactly what he says he will do. He changes and transforms us so that we have changed hearts and we live life from these changed hearts. No longer are we looking to an external reality to try to bring internal change, but now through Christ Jesus, we have been changed internally and then we live out the reality of that change and that transformation. And this, this is the nail in the coffin to the concept that freedom from the law leads to sinfulness or licentiousness. Because how can it, when you are united with Christ and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit does not sin, Christ does not sin, so how can one who is bound to Christ and filled with the Spirit of Christ walk in sinfulness? It can't. Because you're changed. Because you're transformed. Because you're not the same person you were before you came to Christ. This is why Jesus can say radical things like a tree is known by its fruit. You don't gather grapes from thorn bushes. And so we can look at our lives and we can see the fruit of a changed existence. And it's not anything we brought upon ourselves by keeping some code of conduct, but rather it's the working of the Holy Spirit inside of us which changes us and transforms us. And so in one respect, we should be examining our lives. We should be looking at our lives and saying, do I see fruit? Am I bearing fruit for God? Do I see evidence of the Holy Spirit inside of me that is changing and transforming me so that I no longer desire to walk in sinfulness? When I hitched my wagon to that lady over there, right? I I no longer desired to troll campus looking for a girlfriend, right? Not that I ever did that. They usually flocked to me. And I was kind of like, no, no. No, right? But the point is that marrying my wife, it changed me. I didn't want to do the same things I used to do anymore, right? In fact, when Annie and I first got married, she looked at me and she said, I had an Xbox, not an Xbox 360, I had the old Xbox. And Annie said to me, she said, sell that that Xbox. If we're getting married, sell the Xbox. I played video games all the time. You know what I did? Sold the Xbox. If you're smart and your your fiance is saying, sell the Xbox, sell the Xbox. She's a lot better than a, a gaming system. But I got rid of it, and I changed. I'm not, if you took Dan Collins before he was married and Dan Collins now, he's not the same dude, right? He's not the same guy. I'm changed, and, I, and it's not because my wife wrote out laws on our refrigerator, right? It's not because she took pen and paper and said, all right, you don't do this, Dan, you don't do that, Dan. And every morning I wake up and go, all right, all right, all right, got to remember that, got to remember that, got to remember, remember No, it just comes out of me. Why? Because it's in me, because she's in me, because I love her desperately. Go to the bathroom, man. My son's standing back there pulling down his pants going, Daddy, I have to pee. (laughs) And that's what Paul is saying now. Is that in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. And we're not pursuing sinfulness anymore. Not because Jesus is constantly holding up rules in front of our face saying, Do this but because our heart's different. And our new heart and the spirit within us, he leads us to live a different life. And so Paul has deconstructed this understanding that these opposers are bringing against him. No grace does not lead to sinfulness. No freedom does not lead to sinfulness. Freedom leads to freedom. Grace leads to Jesus and transformation and change. Change. 
and changed people don't want to sin anymore. It tastes bitter in our mouth and we no longer want it because we love Christ. And so the question comes to us, are we getting grace right? Are we understanding grace? Now, we talked about this two weeks ago, but I am convinced that there's a movement within the evangelical church that says, you know what, I'm saved by grace. Jesus loves me. He's full of grace. He's full of forgiveness. I can do whatever I want to do. And somehow we think that's an appropriate application of grace, but Paul would say, no, that's not an appropriate application of grace. In fact, that's not grace at all because grace doesn't end in that kind of thought. Grace ends in the thought of loving Christ and serving Christ out of the spirit, out of a changed heart. So are we getting grace Right. Are we like the guys in chapter 6, verse 1, and chapter 6, verse 15? Well, we can sin because we're under grace. Well, we can sin because we're not under the law. If that's the case, then we're not getting grace right. We're not understanding the power and the change and the transformation that grace brings as it leads us to Jesus Christ. Are we understanding that through grace we've been married to Christ and now married to Christ we've been changed on the inside and so changed on the inside we no longer desire what we used to desire but now we desire Jesus. And we will not be satisfied unless we have more and more and more of him. Are we getting this right? So when we go back to the answer that we posed at the beginning, if through grace we are free from the law how is it that the gospel of grace does not end in a free license to sinful living? The answer to that we now know is that through grace we are married to Christ. We are changed on the inside so that we live new lives in service to God, bearing fruit for Him, not through external written code, but through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That is what Paul has taught us. That is what Paul has taught those who are accusing him of preaching a lawless gospel. I don't preach a lawless gospel. Paul says, I preach a gospel that changes and transforms people. So are we changed and transformed by the gospel? Are we getting grace right? Are we living new lives, married to Christ, changed from the inside, no longer desiring what we used to desire, but now desiring Jesus? That's what grace does in our lives. It doesn't set us free to sin. It sets us free and it empowers us to live for Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for your word. We praise you and thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your grace, which has not set us free to sin, Father, but your grace has set us free to be married to Christ and to walk in newness of life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand grace and understand it all the more. In Christ's name, amen. What's well, our prayer every time that we...